begin to worship together and uh, raise our praises to our Lord. New microphones, we're all getting used to them, how they work, so, but we're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Would you stand up with us? We're actually going to begin this morning while the band is playing, and we're going to read the scripture together that's on the screen for you from Galatians 2.20. So let's read this together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're going to sing that this morning.
truth with them. Father, we are so blessed, and we do not for a moment take for granted how richly and how lavishly you have poured out your grace on us, not because of anything that we have done or earned or achieved, but simply because of who you are, because of your character. And God, we thank you to live in a place where you can be celebrated publicly, where we can pray publicly, where we can shout out the praise of your name as you have called us to do. May we always do so without taking advantage or for granted our, liber our liberties. And God, we look to those men and women and those families that have lost, that have sacrificed and given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom and for these liberties to worship you that we so enjoy. And we thank God of their model, not just for us, but in the way that they emulate you and your sacrifice. God, we think of the way that you yourself did not withhold even your only son from us so that we would have freedom in his name. God, may we look to those brave men and women that we celebrate and remember in our country this weekend, and may we look to their example of sacrifice, of service to others, of giving up, of denying ourselves certain things so that we can live for something bigger than ourselves. I pray that we would do that in our country, in our communities, but even in your kingdom as we shout and proclaim freely the name of your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. And I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many of you know somebody who served in the military? Yeah. And then how many of you know somebody maybe in your family that died in, in battle? Anybody? So we're always thankful for uh, those people who sacrificed their lives, sacrificed their time to serve, and we're so grateful for that. Would you stand with us? We're just going to continue worshiping our Lord this morning and sing along with Kristen this morning as she goes. Who am I that the highest king would win? His love for me, oh, His love for me, oh, the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes, I am, free at last.
the right to become children of God. Isn't that a wonderful promise this morning? He's prepared a place for us. Amen. He deserves applause for what he has done for us. Thank you so much for worshiping with us, lifting your voices. You may be seated.
Well, good morning. Great, all three of you. Awesome. Yes, well, good to, good to have you here. Thanks for joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. And I do want to say, uh, just from an American point of view, from a patriotism point of view, uh, we love the freedoms that we do not deserve, built on the backs and the blood of those that died for our country. And uh, I'm very thankful for those freedoms. It's something that most people throughout history have not enjoyed. And so be sure, especially tomorrow, to give some thought to those who gave their lives for us to be able to do this thing that we are doing right here. So happy uh, Memorial Day. Well, I have a theory. You want to hear my theory? My wife wants to hear my theory. Do you think that's true? (laughs) Let's theorize on whether or not she wants to hear my theory, just for a second. Okay, so here's my theory. My theory is that those who have the clearest view of heaven also gain a clearer view of the meaning of life, the purpose of life, why they're here. And here's what I mean by this. Do you remember back when you were in elementary and you wanted so much to have that one teacher and you thought that your life would be over if you didn't get that one teacher? You remember back in junior high when you had to sit by that one guy or that one girl at lunch or your life would be over? Do you remember back in high school when you had to get that new outfit that you saw in the mall or things just wouldn't go right? Do you remember that one college that you just had to get into? Do you remember that place that you had to have your wedding or it just wouldn't be perfect? Do you remember that first house you bought that that was your dream house that was now like three houses ago? Do you remember that son of yours that you had to get into all the right academics or all the right sports so he would have every chance to become a great player? Do you remember that job that you had to get or that career that you had to have? Or that amount of money you had to have in retirement if you were going to retire safe and secure? Do you remember having to be at your first child's birth? Do you remember having to have that family heirloom when mom passed away? Do you remember, fill in the blank, that moment in life, that thing you had to have, that thing you had to do, that now you look back at that moment That was so important back then, but now when you look back, suddenly those Jordache jeans in high school, remember Jordache jeans in high school? Not so important today. Did I say Jordache? I don't know where that came from. Weren't those jeans? Jordache jeans? Okay, that's, I thought maybe I made that up all of a sudden. I do that sometimes. So here's my theory. My my theory is that, that We all, in our moments of life, we have these have-to-have and have-to-do moments. That in that moment, they seem so important. They seem like life is going to stop if that doesn't happen, or I don't get to go there, or I don't get to have that thing. And then years later, we look back, and we, we don't even remember that thing that was so important in the moment. And I wonder if, when we get to heaven... We're going to look back at not just all of our have-to-have moments and have-to-do moments, but we're going to look back at a lot of the things that we thought were so important in life. But we get to heaven, and we see all that heaven is, and we see Jesus and all the beauties there, and we kind of go, yeah, you know what? Those Jordache jeans, not so important. There's going to be something about heaven once we're there that is going to give perspective to our life Now, what would happen if we could, in this moment right now, get that same perspective of heaven? What would it change about how we live our life? What would it change about how we see life? What would it change about how we react to the have-to-have, have-to-do moments? And I think it's for that reason that, if I can just be honest, I've been really disappointed with how some Christians have responded to this moment in history right now, this pandemic, and and. I think it says something about how we really view heaven, or maybe how we don't really view heaven. So my theory goes that 
going to be up there, but I don't really have to worry about what it's going to be like until I'm like at my deathbed, death door kind of moment. But what would happen if we could see, like some of the stories in the Bible, like Jacob's ladder, he sees this ladder going up to heaven. Stephen, before he's stoned, he gets this view of heaven. What if we could get a view of heaven, what it's really going to be like? What would it change? What would it fine-tune in our life now? So my theory is that your view of heaven will affect your view of life. Your view of heaven will affect your view of life. Let me give you one view of heaven that we have in the Bible from Isaiah 6-5. Here's what it says. Just listen. I think I might have it up there for you, but just here's what it says. This is one of those like pull back the curtains, get a view into heaven kind of, of perspectives. Here's what it says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And he called to one another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, this is the person that's viewing this, the, God, the, the person who's seeing heaven, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What if we could peel back the curtain? And see what Isaiah saw. The king high and lifted up. To see the the angels. To see the throne. To see heaven. What if we could see that? What would it change now? So again, my theory is if you can catch and really get a clear view of heaven, it might just change your life. Now last week I said that by and far the greatest thing about heaven is that Jesus is there. That's the greatest thing. But um, as much time as we spent on that last week, there's all kinds of other things that we're going to love about heaven. And the Bible tells us about heaven. And some of those things are the beauties. Many of those things have to do with people we love. That we believe they, they died as believers and today they're in heaven. So grandma and grandpa. When we think about grandma and grandpa, we think of grandma and grandpa there. And we look forward to a time when we will see Grandpa, see grandma. Or if you're a widow, that your spouse is there. Have you ever thought this thought? That the people in heaven, in their perfection, they've never loved their loved ones that are still here more and better than they do right now. So, widow, your spouse has never loved you better never loved you clearer, and never loved you more than he or she does right now in heaven. Or that child that perhaps you lost has never loved you better, never loved you more, never loved you more fully than he or she does right now. And so there's a great part of heaven when we think about Jesus is going to be there, our loved ones are going to be there. But of all those beauties, again, the greatest thing about heaven is that Jesus is going to be there. And we're going to love seeing grandma and grandpa. We're going to love to see those people that have gone before us. Uh, I never had the chance to meet three of my four grandparents. I look forward to that moment, if it comes, uh, in heaven. My grandma was always very old. Uh, I never hardly knew her, even though she died uh, after I was born. But what's it going to be like to get into heaven and meet my grandpa? And I never met that set a legacy of faith for my family. What's it going to be like to, to see him? So there's a lot of things that we look forward to in heaven. Uh, we're not going to lose perspective or uh, keep, we're going to keep Jesus as the most important, the greatest thing about heaven uh, in our minds. But there's going to be a lot of other things that are wonderful, meaning full of wonder, wonderful as we get uh, to heaven. Because the Bible gives us some clues about those other things. And some of those other things are what I want to talk about today. And we learn in the Bible that God is going to change us, our minds, our bodies, our emotions, even spiritually. We're going to be changed uh, in heaven. 
And of course, we're going to enjoy Jesus more than anything else, but we're also going to enjoy the change. What's that change going to be like? Let's walk through some of those things, and I'm not going to be able to talk about, you know, in depth about any of them, so let's just kind of skim the surface of what the Bible has to say about some of the changes that we will experience physically, emotionally, that we will experience when we get to heaven. So let's begin with our bodies. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are children, God's children now, but what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So there's a transformation that happens to every single one of us as we go to heaven. Now, there's all kinds of mystery in that, but there is definitely a transformation. And in some way, the new bodies, this new perfected, resurrected body that we're going to have is going to be similar to the body that Jesus had. There's going to be a transformation that way. So here's what that means. And we always think about the bodies and, and all that's going to be. But what that means uh, more deeply is that there are things that are going to be the same as they are now for us. And there are things that are going to be different. So there's going to be a continuity between some of life, some experience that we have here, and what we will experience someday in heaven. So there are differences, but there are also there's a continuity. So nothing is totally lost. Nothing stays the same. What that means is that when you look in the mirror in the morning, what you see in the mirror, that face that you see, will be similar to the face that you see in heaven. Now, this is either good news or bad news, uh, depending on what you see. But you are going to look like you in heaven. You're still going to be you. I had, a, I had a buddy say that, you know, when you get to heaven, everyone's going to have a perfect body. And he's a, he was a big, large, large man. So he's like, so everybody's going to look like me. And he kind of did that atlas pose, you know. And I said, that'll be one ugly woman. Uh, so we all don't want to look that, like that. So in these glorified bodies, we're going to have a body. Now, now, follow me along. Your body is going to look like your body does now, minus the sin, the, the, the tainting, the corruption that comes along with sin, but you're still going to look like you. So if, if you're really tall now, don't think you're going to get to heaven and be suddenly short. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, women with straight hair want curly hair, curly hair want straight hair, people who are short want to be tall, so don't think that you're going to get to heaven and you're going to completely be a totally different person. You're going to look like you. But without any of the corruption, without any of the sin, without the sin nature, and all the things that come along with it. So yes, Jake, Larry, Jeff, Scott, a few of us, we may have a little more hair in heaven if you think this is part of the sin nature. Or I could just say, this is beautiful. What do you think, Jake? This is part of the glory of Jesus, I would say, right? That's what I would say. Some people have suggested that when we get to heaven, we're all going to be 33 years old, okay? And they say that for a couple of reasons. They say that, number one, because Daniel is 33. That's right. So Daniel, prime of life, right here. This is as good as it's going to get, right here. <laughs> so 33, they say, is that, that perfect age where you're still kind of prime of life, but you're moving into the mature part of life. 33, supposedly, is that perfect age. Others say it's 33 because Jesus, we think, was 33 when he died at the prime of his life. So maybe we will be 33. We don't, we don't know. I don't know how that would work. So let's say for my grandma, uh, I only ever knew her as old. Uh, she was very elderly when she gave birth to my dad. Uh, so I only ever knew her as old. If I get when I get to heaven and I see grandma there and she's 33, will I recognize her? Or how about somebody who loses a child? Or how about aborted babies? I don't know how that's all going to work. Jesus is going to sort it out. And when he does and we get there, we're going to go, yeah, that was the right thing. He got it. He nailed it. He got it perfect. So our bodies are going to be different. They're going to be changed. And if you spend some time thinking about all that that could mean, Every, every bit of your body that is connected to the sin, whether it's disease or cancer, or uh, certain disabilities, mental or physical, 
things like sagging and wrinkles and losing hair and other things. Those are all part of the sin nature. It's all gone when we get to heaven. We're going to have a body much like Jesus. But it's not just our bodies that change. We have personalities that are going to continue from this life to that life. So don't think that you're going to be just a totally different person. Our personal knowledge uh, continues. We see this most clearly in this parable of Lazarus and the rich man. You can read it later out of Luke 16. Now, if Jesus is telling a real story, uh, and there's some debate about that, but you have this guy named Lazarus. It's the only parable Jesus told that had a name attached to it, which is why people believe this was a real story. Uh, in that story, you have Lazarus in heaven, and Lazarus is in heaven, and he's being comforted, which only makes sense if he's being comforted for his affliction that he had here, and he's being comforted with the joys of heaven there. So that's, that's the comfort. But even, even in the midst of that, he's thinking about his brothers. He's thinking about his life. He's remembering his life. So there's a part of personality and memories that continue from this life to that life. So think of it this way. If you're really witty here, you'll be really witty there. If you're an introvert here, you'll probably be an introvert there. Your personality will continue. Now, the funny part of that, if you really try to wrap your mind around that, how much of our personality that we currently have has changed over the years? How much of our personality is because we've had to fight with our own sin nature or the consequences of sin? That it, and part of that has made us who we are. I don't know what happens when all that sin nature is removed, but I think our personality continues from uh, this life uh, to the next life, including, funny enough, in this parable, Lazarus has memories. Like, you could read some books on heaven that say you're going to forget everything that ever happened here on earth. And I don't think that's true. I think our memories are going to continue from this life to that life. We're going to even remember much better. I'll get to that in just um, a minute. But our minds are going to be redeemed from all that has been tainted and all the limitations imposed upon us by sin. So our personality is going to continue, but be better because sin is gone. Our bodies are going to be changed. Uh, the sin nature is going to be removed. We're going to have a body like Jesus. But our love for others is also going to continue there. And um, I think one of the misnomers about heaven is that all we're going to need in heaven is Jesus. And I'm going to talk about that here in a few minutes because I think it reveals a little bit of a, 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 an edge of heresy that we carry about heaven and God. I'll come back to that in just a second. But we, we as human beings, we're made by God to want and enjoy companionship, friendship, relationships. Why would we think that the way that God made us as people needing to be known and to know other people would somehow change and be removed in heaven? That all we're going to need and all we're going to care about is Jesus without caring about each other uh, in the same way. If you think about that, one of the reasons that God created the universe, if we go all the way back to the beginning and we try to wrap our minds around why did God create the universe? He didn't have to. He wasn't lacking anything. He wasn't bored in heaven and thought, let's give this a whirl, see what happens. God created the universe in part uh, because he wanted to be known. And then right after creation, he says, you know, right after God creates everything, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. So part of the way that he fundamentally created us as human beings is to love and enjoy companionship together and we're going to continue to have that and do that in heaven in fact paul says in first thessalonians 2 he says for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our lord jesus at his coming is it not you for you you people in thessalonica you are our glory and joy so there's a hint here that even when Paul is in heaven, part of the joy that he's going to have in heaven is being in heaven with those that are with him, his, those that he's loved. And I take this as pretty emphatic proof of not only do our memories and relationships continue from here to there, but there's also going to be a joy in heaven for the relationships that we will enjoy uh, there. So there's a little doubt, I think, among believers that uh, as we think about what heaven's going to be like and and we anticipate heaven, who is there is a big part of what we 
uh, think about. You know, grandma and grandpa and that special mentor and uh, siblings. Who is there is going to be really, really important. Have you ever thought that, that every day in heaven, there is a welcome celebration going on? A welcome, welcome home. Like, you know when you see those, those movies of that soldier that comes back and surprises mom, or comes back and surprises his kids, he walks into school, big celebration, you know, it's a, like a tearjerker every time. Have you ever thought that in heaven, in every moment of heaven, there is one of those going on, or many of those going on? As that loved one who, who has been on earth and separated comes home, and there's this big welcome celebration. And I don't know if they meet him at the pearly gates, and I don't know how that all works, or they just like appear, here am I, well, where have you been? You know, because time doesn't really exist in heaven. Uh, I don't know how that all works. But every moment in heaven, as those, those on this earth die and go to heaven, there is a reunion like no other with those that they love in heaven. So our love for others, that we, the love that we have here, will continue there. But it, think about how those relationships will be. No more sin, no more deception, no more selfishness. What kind of relationship will develop in that kind of a place? So our bodies, our emotions, our love, and also um, the next one I want to talk about is, is the emotions and the feelings part uh, that will continue from this life to the next life. Psalm 1611 says this, In your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forever. So there's a part of heaven that is the perfecting of the highest and the greatest moments of earth, but now in heaven perfected in a way that we never experienced on earth. That, that perfection, that, that joy, that, uh, that enjoyment in the moment is exponentially multiplied uh, in heaven. Sorrow will cease there. And one of my favorite views of heaven is, is, is how God, God wipes away every tear. And almost any time you talk about heaven, there's an idea of, of no more sorrow, no more burdens that we carry. He'll wipe away every tear. Now, how, how that works, I don't, I don't know. Because if we remember things from here, Will we have disappointment there for how we lived our life here? I don't know how that works. Will we remember those, our loved ones, that, didn't, that we thought were going to be in heaven and they're not? Will we have sorrow over that? I think we will. But I think that view of sorrow that we have with God wiping away every tear from our eyes, it's not only the sorrow, but it's also the restoration that happens. I think that's the view of the, of the wiping away tear, that there's a restoration in heaven that God himself uh, takes part in. I think one of the best ways you can think about heaven is to understand that our existence in heaven will be a lot like our earthly life. But perfected, glorified, and devoid of any limit caused by sin. So it's a lot like, some have said, that heaven is going to be like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be plush. It's going to be God walking in the cool of the morning with, with Adam and Eve, that we're trying to get back to Eden, and that's what heaven uh, will be like. I think the important point there, though, is, is that so much of what we enjoy about this presence, this life right now, there's always a sin taint. There's always an edge. There's always a selfishness. There's always a hurt. There's always a burden. But there, none of those things None of those burdens, none of those sorrows, none of those, those, the, the heaviness, none of the hurts, none of the grudges, all those are gone. And what's left is our ability to enjoy all that heaven is in a way we've never been able to enjoy earth. And don't forget this verse that we read last week, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So even as we think about an existence in heaven without the taint, without the burdens, without the grudges, without the hurts, without sin at any level, mind, physically, spiritually, it's all gone. And the best that we can imagine in our head of what that's going to be like, heaven is going to be so much better than even that. 
So we'll have bodies that are flawless. We'll have minds that are sharp. We'll have emotions that are godly. And our spirits will be filled with the glory of King Jesus. And if those are the things that we think and imagine now, think what it will really be. So here we have this perfected body we've talked about. It's glorious. It's flawless. Who we are on the inside, our emotions, our spirits, our love, uh, will all be perfected. And we'll have abilities beyond what we can imagine. And it seems like some of those abilities, and I don't want to overdo it too much, but remember that Jesus in his resurrected body, in his glorified body, he had some abilities that you and I currently do not have. He appears in the upper room. Whether or not he walked through the wall, I don't know how that happens, but he appears in the upper room. At one moment he's in Galilee, and the next moment he's in Emmaus, walking with some guys. He seemed to be able to make those changes and make those uh, moves that way. Remember Moses and Elijah on the top of Mount Transfiguration. They were changed into what they really look like in heaven. And there's a brilliance, there's a glory, there's a shining that happens that's a part of them. That will be us in heaven. And it's a great view. And I think if we just dream a little bit about you know, the glory, the body, the emotions, the spirit, the relationships, and the love... All without sin, without hurt, without past, without baggage, without all of that. That's a pretty great place to think about. So that's what we're going to look like and be like. And so with all that glory and all that ability, what are we going to do in heaven? And I think it's the do question that leads us into what I believe reveals a little edge of heresy that many of us and maybe all of us carry at some level. You see, there's a lot of people that will say something like this. I would rather have a good time in hell than be bored for all eternity in heaven. Have you heard something like that? Probably you have. And here's what I think. I I think it betrays a little part of us when we really think about heaven. There's a little part of us at times that thinks that heaven is going to be boring. And what it reveals is that we think at some level, at least a little grain of truth, we think God is boring. Sin is fun. God is boring. There's an edge to us, I think, if we are really honest in uh, in our innermost being, we feel that sometimes. Like I remember as a kid when they would talk about heaven, um, that all we're ever going to do in heaven is be in this big choir singing. And I'm like, I don't like to sing. I don't want to go to heaven because that sounds boring. Or all we're going to do is we're going to sit on the clouds and we're going to play our harps, right? And I'm like, that sounds boring. I don't want to go to heaven. There's a little edge at times that we think heaven sounds boring. Well, listen, not only will heaven be glorious with all the beauties, friendships, Jesus is there. But heaven is going to be fun. Yep, I said fun. Heaven is going to be fun. Someone once dared to say that there's not going to be any golf in heaven. Ken, can you imagine? No golf in heaven. All right. And the reason they said that is because how fun would it be to make a hole in one every time? Well, let's think about that just a little bit. Why would we assume that while we're in heaven... And all the, the glories and the beauties that are there and the relationships that we enjoy. That there isn't at some fundamental level development. Perfection that happens over time. That we're going to learn while we're there. We're going to increase our abilities and our knowledge while we're there. And if that's true, then why wouldn't even physically our ability to play golf improve while we're there? And it seems like Uh, Others say that golf can't be in heaven because only a sadistic man created, you know, golf in the first place, right? And when I play golf, I don't always think holy thoughts, (laughs) no pun intended. Uh, But that perfected, resurrected body and and all those things, they're, they're given to us for a reason. And this is an important part, and I think the lack of teaching around heaven about about what it's going to be like, this is where we really lose out. Because we think all we're going to do in heaven is sing songs. 
All we're going to do in heaven is like in, in these massive stands. We're going to be standing there. We're going to be wearing some like funky polyester choir robes that don't fit right and they're hot and they're annoying and all we're ever going to do is sing. But the Bible begins to paint a little different picture. And again, we only have little snippets of information about what we're going to do in heaven. And yes, singing the praises of, of Jesus is a part of it, but that's not the only thing that we're going to do. And before we read two passages, the first one is Matthew 25. We're going to read that. But have you ever thought this thought? When I stand amazed at God's creation, whether it's a sunset whether it's a new little baby grandchild, congratulations to the Carson extended family. Kenzie had her baby last night, or this morning, I guess. Yes, uh, congratulations. But when you, when you see and you enjoy the beauty of creation, and you think in your heart, God made this, that that expression is something that glorifies God. And if that's true in the here and the now, how much more will it be true in heaven? With the beauty that we enjoy, and just enjoying the beauty will be glory given to God. Just when we see that next nebula, when we see and va the vastness of space, and we go, wow, can you believe he made all of this? That there is something in that amazement that glorifies uh, God. I think that's very true. And I think it gives us a little bit of a hint of what we're going to do in heaven. Matthew 25, if you turn there with me in your Bibles, please. I want to skip around and, and try to quickly read a couple different verses here but in Matthew 25 we have what many believe to be a uh, little bit of an account of what heaven will be like for us and what we will do from a work point of view so the first verse I want to read is verse 31 so Matthew 25 verse 31 because I think this sets the the tone when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he'll separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. So that's setting the tone of what contextually uh, we, we're reading here. But now let's go back to verse 21. Because in the middle of verse 21, Jesus is telling this story. And it's a story about this faithful servant and the rewards that this faithful servant gets when the master returns. So the context is verse 31, the master is returning. The story, uh, the previous part, is about what happens when the master comes back. Look at verse 21. It says in verse 21, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also said, also, and, and he also, who had two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you, where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has will be given, more will be given, and he who has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. It's a very interesting story. I don't have time to really talk about the whole thing. It's the parable of the faithful servant. And to the two faithful servants, they were given increased measure, increased work. They were given a reward. To the one that had no increase, the unfaithful servant, he was not only given nothing, but he was cast out. The whole point is that there is a reward that comes to the faithful servant. And the context is when the master comes. Flip all the way back in the Old Testament to Isaiah 60. Isaiah chapter 60. And this is the passage that many believe give us the clearest view of what heaven will be like. It may be talking about the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, for those that maybe are millennialists, it maybe is talking about the millennium. Isaiah chapter 60, and again I want to skip it just a little bit. Verse 11 is where I'm going to start. 
In verse 11 it says, Your gates shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut. That people may bring to you the wealth of nations with the kings led in procession. And all of a sudden we have this, this funny kind of view of heaven with gates and nations and wealth. That's probably outside of what we think heaven is going to be like. Now let's skip back to uh, verse, let's see, that was verse 11. Let's skip to verse 20. Look what it says in verse 20. It says, your sun shall, go, shall no more go down, nor moon shall withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall be righteousness, they shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. So again, this, this is a chapter, and you can read it on your own later. It's talking about the future kingdom. And in this future kingdom, in this view that we have, we find nations, we find fruit, we find land, we find cultivation, we find animals, we find occupations like shepherding and ruling. And it's for this reason, these are just two little snapshots, that when we think about heaven and what we're going to do there, we need to think less about standing around in big rows and singing and more about work and responsibility that God will give us dependent upon how we live our life in the here and the now. So we're going to be working in heaven and not just singing. So in the new heaven and the new earth, our using our glorified bodies that we have with the glorified mind, the glorified emotions, no sin, no taint, no no weariness at all, we're going to be given work, each according to our faithfulness. And that work will be perfectly suited for us. Uh, for many of us, work carries this like negative kind of, oh, I got to go to work. Eh. But what if that work had nothing to do with providing enough money or making enough money to have food, and it had everything to do with your joy in what you're doing? in the way that God constructed you, in your interest, in your hobbies, something you enjoy doing, something you want to do, something you do in your free time? What if that was your work that he gave you to do? And so you think of heaven, again, uh, think of heaven in this work aspect of artists having the chance to create like they never were able to create here. Craftsmen able to build to change, to create in ways they never were allowed to here. Think of teachers that will be able to instruct students that don't annoy them. Imagine how that will be, teachers there. And, and some of you in heaven, you're going to be out of the job that you have right now because there's no police in heaven, no doctors, no funeral homes, none of that. So as you think about the work Take that job, that hobby, that interest, that thing that you love to do. And if you could completely remove it from any sense of you know, financial worry, what is that thing that, you, that would bring you joy and bring joy to God in your joy that just might be your job in heaven? Which is kind of bad news. Can I give you the bad news? In heaven, we're all going to work for the government. <laughs> right? We're all going to work. We're all going to be government workers. We're all going to be standing around on the road as construction workers. No. We're all going to be government workers because we're all going to be working for the glory of the king. That's what we're going to do. And I say that jokingly, but remember that, that part of this view that we have in Isaiah 60, we have a view here of nations. That means society. And those nations are bringing in wealth. They're bringing something to the king. There's culture. Society and culture are part of being humans. And, and let's not think that we're going to get to heaven and that's going to change. There's continuity. There are differences, but there's continuity between this life and the next life, fundamentally, in who we are. So as you think about heaven, then, if artists are going to be artisting, craftsmen are going to be craftsmening. I'm making those verbs. Those are awesome. It means that part of what we're going to do in heaven is to enjoy what the artist is making. Enjoy what the craftsman is creating. Enjoy what the farmer is growing. We're going to be enjoying those things. There's going to be entertainment, music, song, dance. We'll tell stories. 
do dramas. And we'll laugh like we never laugh here. Those like really deep belly laughs where you snort at the end. Yeah. Laugh like that in heaven. Why not? All the inhibitions. All that makes you want to do that but you can't. The taint of sin. It's all gone. Laugh like no other. And we're going to play. We're going to play. I don't know if we're going to have sports like we do here. Is there going to be, you know, back to golf in heaven? Uh, I don't know. Uh, If there is golf in heaven, there's been people there for like 500 years. They're going to be way better than me. But I'm going to catch up. I hope they have golf carts, Ken, because you can't golf without a golf cart, of course. So the flip side of that, then, is is not only are we going to be able to be doing all of this stuff, but think of what we're going to be able to explore. We're going to be able to explore hobbies, explore new things, new areas. We're going to be able to try new things. Explore parts of the universe. Go to places in space that we've always wanted to go. Like if you've ever wanted to swim in the sea of tranquility on the moon, give it a try. You'll be able to do all those things. My point is that sometimes when we think about heaven, we think it sounds boring. But when you really get into it and you begin to dream and you take these little snapshots of what we have in the Bible, it creates this different picture that is far beyond choir robes in heaven. And it's much more to a place beyond our wildest dreams with the joy and the fun and the laughter that only God could give us. Which brings, us, brings me to my most profound question of the day. Will we drink coffee in heaven? It's profound. Now, for some of you, if the answer is no, you're like, I don't want to go, right? Uh, I've, I've thought sometimes that we could make this like an evangelistic point, Right? You want to drink coffee forever? Inquire within. Why not? Well, let me answer that question a little bit. We, we learn about food in different ways in little snippets throughout the Bible of what food and heaven is going to be like. Now, of course, we're not going to need food like from a sustenance point of view, but we're certainly going to be able to eat food. And we see, we see Jesus eating food. We see God and angels, Genesis 18. We see them eating food. Uh, We're all invited, Revelation 2, we're all invited to what we call uh, to eat of the tree of life. We're all invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. Uh, We know that Jesus in his resurrected body, he caught fish, cooked fish, and he ate fish. I don't think when he ate it in his resurrected body, you know, put it in his mouth and it fell out the back. It's not the way it worked. He ate fish and enjoyed it. Remember, Jesus said, I'm not going to eat of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I'm not going to eat, not going to drink, but there will be a time that I can. So if you think about heaven with farmers farming and craftsmen creating and shaping and delicate intricacies, that's what heaven's going to be like, but it's also going to apply to food. Listen, is there going to be a Starbucks in heaven? Yeah, but it's going to be on yonder star filled with yuppies drinking overpriced coffee all right there in heaven. I think a great principle is in 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says that God has given us all things to enjoy. So if there are things that we enjoy here, why would we think they're not going to be there? Which brings me to my final question of the day, and I've invited a guest to bring forward. Come on up, Maddie. Because I'm going to ask the question, are there going to be animals in heaven? And so Maddie brought her puppy today for show and tell. This is my son. This is, this is your son. I'm so sorry. I can't remember his name. Flynn. Flynn, yes, Flynn. This is Flynn. And what kind of dog is Flynn? A Boston Terrier. Boston Terrier. Hi, Flynn. Hi. Very nice. Uh, did you think Flynn needed to dress up for church today? He wanted to. No tie? No, no mask? Okay, maybe next time. All right, so let's ask the question. Will Flynn go to heaven? Now, if I ask Maddie, I know what she's going to say, right? Will Flynn go to heaven? Let's ask that question just for, for a minute. Will animals go to heaven? Pets, will there be animals there? Well, we, what we know throughout the Bible is lots of things about animals. We know that God saved the animals on the ark. So he must have cared something for them. We know that God shows the importance of, uh, of animals and strict laws in the Old Testament. Remember, sacrifice, what you can eat, what you can eat, what can be sacrificed, what can't be sacrificed. Why would he care so much about animals? 
one of the things that we find in the Old Testament is that even in animals, we see the glory of God, that God shows his handiwork even in the creativity of animals and what they look like, which is why we love to go to zoos and we stand there and we look at these like sloths and we're like, wow, God thought that thing up. Can you believe that? That woolly, what's the purpose of a sloth? None, except it shows something about the glory of God. You see, in heaven, everything in heaven will reflect every possible attribute and characteristic of God. So why would we think that there wouldn't be animals there? I think there will be. I think, again, it's a view of, of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, there were animals. Why would we think in heaven there wouldn't be? Now, will this particular animal be there? <laughs> Most dogs I know have a sin nature. And they cause our sin nature to rise up at times, right? I don't know. But here's what I would say. The Bible doesn't say, by the way. So if you read about churches that do, like, prayers for animals and stuff like that, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say if our pets are going to go there. Like, is the cow that I'm going to eat for lunch going to be there? I'm pretty sure not. But um, the Bible doesn't say. So I, I would have to say, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But I would say this. I would say that if, if God, in all of his glory, in all of his wisdom, decides to bring pets back to life for my joy, it would just be like him to do something like that. Now, I don't know what that means, but he is going to be seeking my own joy because he is glorified in my joy in him. So if Flynn goes to heaven and he's there and it's for your joy, it would just be like God to do something just like that. Thank you for bringing Flynn. Let you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Made my day. All right, so we're trying to create this view of heaven. And uh, in this view of heaven, we have bodies, emotions, minds that are changed. Even what we do is different. Uh, even what we eat and drink is going to be significant. But compared to the joy of being with Jesus, Compared to the presence of Jesus there, even these fringe benefits, though important, though great, though beautiful, though wonderful, though they'll give us great joy, will be far less when compared to Jesus. But he allows us to take all of these changes, all of these new things, all of these things that we're going to enjoy, and, and we're going to enjoy them with him. And it's going to multiply our joy exponentially. So we're creating this view of heaven. Worship team, you guys can come on up. Uh, we're going to sing this great song, this great old hymn, jazz it up a little bit when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that'll be, and that's how we're going to end today. But we're working on this view of heaven. And again, back to my first point. I believe that the clearer we can understand and see and view heaven, the clearer we will understand the important parts and the insignificant parts of this life. Let's sing this to stand together when we all get to heaven. Let's sing it out like we mean it. The only thing is with this song that you have to learn how to clap on beats two and four. One, two, three, four. So Lisa will get you going, okay? So just follow Lisa on the tambourine. So here we go. One, two, three, four. Got it. Now let's sing it. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Yeah.
that fills you with joy this morning, the thought of it. I'm excited knowing that we will drink coffee in heaven, I'm thinking, so <laughs> I love it. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. If you're worshiping with us at home, thank you for joining us online. We'll see you guys next week again. Have a blessed week.